Part of the genius behind Star Wars is that it works across a wide variety of mediums, and as opposed to other licenses that have found themselves victim to more than the odd botched adaptation, for the most part, it's developed quite a solid reputation when it comes to gaming. Much of that comes down to LucasArts, the famed but now sadly defunct studio slash publisher that brought to life dozens of Star Wars titles to PC and consoles over a period spanning over 25 years. They nailed the galaxy time and time again, and while they're sadly no longer with us, Star Wars games are finally, at long last, getting good again, with Battlefront 2 mounting a solid comeback and Jedi Fallen Order turning in the best single-player Star Wars title in well over a decade. For all that the Star Wars games have succeeded though, even the best ones haven't managed to nail every aspect of the franchise. Whether through a weird narrative decision or design choice, Star Wars games have rarely ever been perfect at adapting the source material, and constantly seen to repeat the same mistakes over and over again. That doesn't make them bad games, of course, but to quote everyone's favourite Viceroy, this is getting out of hand. So, I'm Ewan, this is What Culture Gaming, and here are 8 times video games got Star Wars wrong. Number 8. Neglecting the lightsaber and making Starkiller way too powerful, The Force Unleashed. The Force Unleashed is good. It was one of the first games I ever followed through its development, and it made me a huge fan of William Hayden Blackman, who, fun fact, went on to write comics for DC. The game puts you in the shoes of one Galen Marek, a secret apprentice to Darth Vader who went by the codename Starkiller. Another fun fact, he was played by Sam Witwer, who went on to voice Maul so well in The Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. The game placed a huge focus on the Force, but in that kind of OTT legendsy way where you take down Star Destroyers with your bare hands and turn legions of Stormtroopers into Bantha fodder with little difficulty. That's fine for a video game, I guess, but part of being a Jedi or Sith is to wield the coolest weapon known to the galaxy, the lightsaber. It is there in the Force Unleashed, but it's kind of an afterthought, which took away from the experience overall. Number 7. Turning lightsabers into dull instruments. Various. Lightsabers are literally the coolest weapons in sci-fi history, and they're also super lethal. Take a lightsaber to a limb, and it's liable to fall off. In the realm of video games, however, lightsabers are more like labors, because they're so tedious to use, on account of the fact they don't cut things anymore. As far as I can remember, the only Star Wars game I feel genuinely got the lightsaber right was Jedi Outcast. Fallen Order is a close second, but the lack of dismemberment makes the whole affair feel ever so slightly less weighty and visceral. There are by far worse examples though. In nearly every Star Wars game of the last 15 years, taking a lightsaber to an enemy has felt like you're simply bonking them on the head with an oversized glow stick. Bonk! Take that, Stormtrooper! Bonk! Feel my blade, Inquisitor! Bonk! Taste defeat, Battlefront bugs! Now I totally get why this is a thing. Rating systems have gotten way more strict over the last decade, and insta-kills would kind of ruin the challenge, but there has to be a middle ground, somewhere in between Fallen Order's faux dismemberment and the ultra-powerful weapon seen in the Jedi Knight series. Number 6. Putting Star Wars in the wrong genre, Masters of Terrace Cassie. Look, right, there are some things that make sense as a Star Wars game, and some things that just don't. First person shooter? Good. Weird motion control dance game? Bad. Okay, maybe not that bad as Solo is a legitimate bot, but, but still. Third person action adventure? Good. 3D fighting game? Bad. Masters of Terras Cassie might have been good for a reference in Solo A Star Wars Story, but the game just didn't make any sense at all. There's so much that you can do with the Star Wars license, and awkwardly retrofitting it to capitalise on the fighting game craze of the 90s is definitely not one of them. Number 5. Crossing the Errors, Battlefront 2 2017 Okay, so Star Wars Battlefront 2 is legitimately great. It had an awful launch, and there might still be too much for people to look past to see what DICE have done with the game since, but seriously, play Battlefront 2 now, and you'll be playing one of the most genuine and fun Star Wars games ever released. Even now though, with the game having been tossed aside by EA to focus on Battlefield 6, yeah, that's the whole thing. It still isn't perfect, and there's one major design choice that I really feel was the wrong decision to make. The lack of an error lock. What do I mean by an error lock? Well, basically I mean ensuring everything is where it should be. That means characters shouldn't be appearing in errors where they don't belong in, and blasters are restricted to the error in which they appeared. 
Sadly, Battlefront 2 just didn't do that, and instead allowed players to play as Darth Vader in The Clone Wars, or Obi-Wan in the sequel trilogy. And look, right, yes, I know this makes you sound like President Business from the Lego movie or whatever, but there's a correct place for things to be in Star Wars, and when those things aren't in the right place, it has me raising my Sackler rifle and doing the Tuscan shuffle with great displeasure. Number 4. Visualising the Force, the Force Unleashed, and the Jedi Knight series. Yes, I'm ragging on the Force Unleashed yet again, but not without justifiable cause, so long as you can count justifiable as being totally pedantic and nitpicky. I know how this makes me look. Jump back into either The Force Unleashed or its slightly inferior sequel. Seriously, The Force Unleashed 2 story lasts about four hours in total and it's, well, it's not good. And you'll notice the rather odd decision to visualize The Force as a weird, airy, blue thing. In fact, in the first title, whenever Starkiller charges up a Force push, it's as if he's unleashing a miniaturized spirit bomb from Dragon Ball, something we've definitely not seen in the films before. In a way, making the Force manifest in tangible blueness kind of takes away from its mystical aura. Fallen Order does a much better job of articulating it all in that sense, whereas those earlier LucasArts titles, Force Unleashed and Jedi Knight specifically, never seem to feel comfortable not giving some sort of blue hue to a Jedi's abilities. Number 3. The Jedi Mind Trick, Jedi Knight, and Star Wars Battlefront one of the major stumbling blocks with gamifying the Force is that it can be tricky adapting those powers that have so many different applications. The biggest one is undoubtedly the Jedi Mind Trick. The signature move of Obi-Wan Kenobi, aka the best Jedi ever, this particular Force ability enables the user to bend their opponent's will and force them to respond to a given command, which is actually pretty terrifying when you put it like that. Video games have adapted this ability in a variety of different ways, but it's rarely ever lined up with how it's depicted in the films, TV shows, and related Star Wars media. In fact, most of the time, mind tricking an opponent in a Star Wars game will simply have them either switch sides and attack their allies, or, in Battlefront's case, have them lose access to their abilities or invert their controls. It's better than nothing, but it seems like an ability that should be more context sensitive than how it's previously been depicted. Number 2. Nailing the nuances of Starfighter Combat – Various If it wasn't already apparent that this video was made by DorkBot5000 or, I don't know, Darth Nerdius the Lame, I'll give you this entry on the technical aspects of Starfighter Combat, because if there's anything I do know well, it's my audience. And just to be clear, Star Wars Squadrons absolutely nailed the experience of hopping in a cockpit and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy. EA Motive deserve major props for finally delivering the ultimate Starfighter experience, right on down to controlling where your energy goes, but there are still other areas to improve in a possible sequel. For one, no Star Wars game has actually attempted to show off the transition between atmospheric and non-atmospheric flight. Vehicles like the Y-Wing actually perform worse when they're not in space. There are other aspects of Starfighter battles that would be great to see in Game 2. For instance, instead of it being piloted by a single person, wouldn't it be great to have multiple players in the Millennium Falcon at once, controlling all the different turrets and all the bombers in Battlefield? It would also be great to see more involvement on the cruiser side of things, and how capital ships engage with one another. Maybe take a leaf out of Star Trek bridge crew and have players work together to take on a given threat. None of these are necessary features of course, but it's just the case that more could be done to make space combat as authentic as possible. And number one, ignoring the wider galaxy. Various. When it comes to video games, by far the most immersive tend to focus on detail. Perhaps the best example of video game immersion is Red Dead Redemption 2, with Rockstar pulling out all the stops to create a world that felt lived in and genuine. Part of the joy of that particular Red Dead is the emphasis on non-essential features, what some players would contemptuously refer to as busy work. As protagonist Arthur Morgan, you can do pretty much anything – play cards, perform chores around the camp, or go fishing – or the idea of making the player feel like they're inhabiting a genuine space. Now, what's this got to do with Star Wars? Well, the franchise itself is one of the most elaborate and fleshed out properties ever committed to film. Its foundations are thick and sturdy, and the mythology itself is not enough bottomless. However, players only ever engage with one or two aspects of that world, and it mostly comes down to warfare and the Jedi Order, with little room for distractions. 
That's fair given they are the two most important tenants of the franchise, but when will players get to try the hand at bounty hunting? In a good game, I should clarify, Star Wars Bounty Hunter is not good Scott Telford, smuggling, or even a friendly game of Sabacc or Hollow Chess. Part of the joy of Star Wars is those little details, but for the most part, players only get to engage with that universe by blasting or slicing it to pieces. Why not try a different approach? Like, I don't know, maybe being a politician on Coruscant, and you get to rally E.T. around your trade legislation that you've crafted before it got nuked by the trade delegation from Malastare. This, this, th that's a bad idea, okay. Well, anyway, that was our list. Let us know of the times you think video games got Star Wars wrong down in the comments below. And please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you haven't done so already. 